You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. Daryl Milton Tomlinson is my full name. I go by my middle name, Milton. I decided once I got on this quest that I would honor my mother and take the name Milton as my, my name as I embark on this career. And not just because I'm a descendant, halfway from John Milton, but because of my mother, who really, really inspired me. So my mother was a seamstress. She was very creative. She actually made all our clothes when I was younger made of very elaborate things for my sister, you know, these wonderful dresses and stuff. And my mother was really talented. And I took it for granted, you know, we kind of do that when we're younger. You know, we kind of see those things, we take it for granted. And I, I used to always say, I don't want to wear those pants. I want those pants from J.C. Panties that everybody else has. Mom. So I thought, I'm going to honor my mother. When I went to college, I studied ceramics and clay, and I loved it. And my mother and father were born in a time, uh, well, they lived through World War II, met during World War II, but lived through the Depression, my dad did, no shoes. And so, and my mother actually raised her sisters uh, in Australia because she lost her father when she was young and her mother was ill. So they all had to quit school and sew, right? So very practical people, my father and my mother. And when I told them about my dream and what I really wanted to do, the look on their face was, you know, they were devastated. And I knew what they were thinking. My son, who dreams a lot, and does a lot, builds things and does all this, were just concerned about him later on in life. And they said, my dad said, you can't make any money at that. I wish he was alive today, because I would introduce him to the ones that have made tons of money. You can't make any money at it. And I know what they were thinking inside. We're going to have to support this guy. He needs a job. And my dad really sold me on the idea of teaching. And that's what I did. And I don't regret a bit of it, because it's giving back. You know, it's giving back. And I ended up actually teaching at a wonderful school. It's called, it was called the Denver School of the Arts. It was the first art school uh, formed in Denver, uh, where students had auditioned to be in the program, sixth through twelfth grades. And we had everything from dance, vocal, instrumental, creative writing, of course, all the visual arts, um, right there in that building. And that was magical, magical. And I thought to myself, what a wonderful opportunity for kids to be able to come here and explore anything they want to explore. And so my goal has always been in teaching to tell kids, dream, right? Follow your dreams. When the train comes by, jump on, because you might not ever see it again. I had a great student named John Ayers. And Johnny, uh, uh, is autistic. Um, and so people, when he auditioned for the program, basically I was told, well, he's autistic. He's, he's challenged. He's not talented. And so my argument all along was, are you kidding me? These guys are so focused. We can't get through to them lots of times. I said, that's the issue. And imagine if we could focus John on jewelry or ceramics or painting. What would that do for him? So uh, I had John for several years. He was in his senior year. He was sitting there fabricating a wonderful piece of jewelry. John, very honest. Most autistic people are. They'll tell you right off the bat. And I was sitting there entering grades in the computer. And John looked up at me, and there was a lot of silence in the room. And he said, they called me. My last name was Tomlinson. They'd always call me Mr. T. Mr. T, why aren't you working? I said, Johnny, I am. I'm entering grades. I'm doing what the school wants me to do. And he goes, no, you're not working at all. You need to go to work. And he looked at me and smiled. 
and I knew just what he was telling me. Go on the quest. Jump on the train. It'll leave. So I did. I did. Uh, I started blowing glass in 2000. It's very recent for me. Some people will tell you it takes years and years and years. Um, and it may take years and years and years to do some things. Uh, but what I do doesn't. Um, it's basically you learn how to make a bubble and you stuff it in a shoe, you know, and you blow it out. And as long as you keep the bubble nice and even and keep it hot in the right spot, it's going to work every time. So I'm not secretive. I believe we should all share the knowledge, otherwise the knowledge dies if you don't share it. So what I'm basically doing, and I realized this when I started blowing glass in 2002 in Penland, is where I started. And I had a great instructor, Jack Schmidt, who's one of the fathers of the modern art glass movement. Um, and he basically opened the door to me to where I always thought you had to make things like the Italians. You had to spend 20 years working and sweating and going through all these techniques, learning to work in a team and to do this. And he gave me the op other option. What I did was uh, my work is kind of retro. Know, and he says it in a very kind way. He said, we made this when we didn't know how to blow glass, which I thought was very interesting. So it kind of, my work is kind of a throwback to the early days. Uh, when I was first blowing glass in Penland, Thur uh, Thurman Statham, who's a pretty famous glass blower, uh, came up to me and I was working at the bench and struggling. And he put his hand on my shoulder he looked into my eyes and he said, you don't know what you're doing, do you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, how do you know? I mean, it's pretty obvious. He goes, that's not what I mean. It's not what I mean. If you don't know the rules, then you can't break them. And so that told me that it really empowered me and, and allowed me to think wide open then. That what are the possibilities for me? What do I like and what do I really want to do? So that's how I kind of got started on this uh, quest. Went from Panlin, went to Haystack, um, from another instructor who's learned, learned a lot about mold blowing there. And ever since uh, being at Haystack, this is what I've been doing. Well, what I have here are um, a number of pieces from different series. I have uh, my earliest piece, how I got started into this. It happens to be here too. and. Um, so I have a, a variety. And what I was really doing with the seed jar, it's actually a seed jar form, is I have experience in pottery. Being from Colorado, we have a rich ceramics tradition there. And um, uh, it's from my, basically, my knowledge of Southwest potters, and I was really involved in and loved to make uh, the seed jars out of clay. And so it's really my take on that, the low, wide form. It's a two-color piece, and when you look to the interior, you see more red inside there, with yellow on the outside. Now this piece was the first one I ever did. And this piece was made in Penland. It was fabricated and blown in Penland. And uh, it was a class that I happened to have a workshop with a, a wonderful gentleman who's a great artist by the name of Shay Rose. And, uh, Che uh, is also a mold blower, and uh, he kind of got me involved in this one day. He said, why don't you go over to the iron studio, see what you can make, and bring it over here and blow some glass inside. And I'm really jazzed about that, so I know the people at the iron studio real well. I know the tech there, the guy that was running it, and I went to him, and I said, can I have some, some pieces out here? And I really don't want scraps. I like some other pieces. He goes, you can have tool steel, you can have whatever you want. Very kind. So I'm digging out all these tools out of here. They're files, uh, chisels, uh, motorcycle chain. It was all in this box. And the interesting story about it is, as I'm picking these things out to work on, a blacksmith student comes over to me and says, what are you doing? Those, that's tool steel. Once again, there's a rule, it's tool steel. You can't use it for anything else. Well, I did, so here it is. And uh, one shot, glass blown inside the mold, and 
That was kind of the beginning of all sorts of ideas that I developed since from there. Very simple. This is really one of my humorous pieces, I think, because it's my self-portrait in 2002. Um, this is Sandcast, and basically what we did was we prepared a box of sand, and so I got my face pushed in and kind of rocked back and forth, which is what you kind of have to do in a sand cast in order to get the piece to release, okay, out of the mold uh, so you can put your glass in there. So you kind of loosen it up a little bit to get it out without knocking more sand inside. So consequently, my nose is kind of to one side. It kind of looks like a boxer's nose in a way. And we decided since I wear glasses that we had pushed some glasses in there. So grabbed some sunglasses and just shoved it in the mold. And then I decided since it was a self-portrait in 2002 to try to come up with something, uh, a composition to sort of hold the focal point. Uh, that really relates to me at the time, and it's definitely scattered. When I first went to Sofa, Chicago, um, visiting, I wanted to try and figure out how I might be able to fit in. And so what I did was I talked to a lot of artists and uh, with beautiful pieces of work. And I would see these wonderful pieces of glass that were just held up by a flat plate of steel and two rods. Beautiful piece of glass and this tacky metal base, you know? That's all I could come up with it. So I decided I had, a, I had a tact on this. And I went home and I made some pieces um, like this, similar to this, smaller. And I took photographs. And then I went back the following year after meeting a few of these artists. And I thought, well, I'm gonna approach them. So I approached a couple. First one I approached, he, I showed him my drawings. I said, what do you think? Instead of that crappy stand you have, what if we create a composition you know, that really complements your work? And he looked at his pieces, and he looked at my photographs, and he looked at his pieces, and he looked at my photographs, he looked at me, and he said, I don't think so. And I thought, oh, do you mind uh, telling me why? You know, my feelings really weren't hurt. I wanted to know what he was thinking. So what did he say? It detracts from my glass. So I knew two things immediately. Glass is precious. And number two, I was on the right track. Because it must have looked pretty good that he felt like they were going to be looking at what I made and not what he made. So that kind of got me started in combining these things. Now this piece in the Glass Fix series, and the Glass Fix really comes from that, the precious part. People think it's, it's a precious, it's precious, it's a precious material. It's alumina, silica, and sand. Let's face facts, right? It's not precious. It's just another material to work with. That's the way I see it, at least. And so what I was doing with the Glass Fix series was kind of making a point about this. And in a way, it's kind of a hypodermic needle sort of shape, you know? Um, and so that's what I was kind of loosely trying to carry off. But what I really like about these is um, I tried to incorporate some traditional uh, blacksmith work in this series. And so what I did was this is a traditional blacksmith's cage. Or basket actually is the correct term would be basket. It pops out into this wonderful shape and you get these uh, little spirals in your metal you know, all the way around. And I was really intrigued by that, and uh, I learned how to do it, and I really liked doing it. So I thought, well, why not incorporate it into these pieces? And then I kind of had that, that added in. What I did was I applied silver to the interior of it and sandblast this, so you get kind of a satiny kind of feel to it. And it kind of carries some of what of its own light as well, is what I discovered. So I made a whole series of pieces that were very reflective first, very chrome uh, looking. I think Don had a picture, one, an image of me at Sofa that had all of my uh, uh, very uh, shiny chrome looking glass pieces that were just clear glass mirrored on the inside. So I thought, well, what would it do if I put a mirror on colored glass? What's going to happen? So we got that effect. And then what I decided to do, again, was sandblast it, but I didn't want to stop there. 
because that's the way I am. It's like, oh, it's perfect. Well, you know, let's play with it. Let's see. So I actually took this out and sandblasted with an industrial blaster to see how my glass would hold up and what will it do. And here I am in a hood and all this stuff, and I'm shooting the sand everywhere, all over the place. And so I really like the effect. It's very different. You get these really big sort of pits that are into the glass that you won't see um, on most pieces. And probably a, a traditional glass blower would say, that's a mistake. But to me, it's not. The last piece you saw had a cage, it had a cage on it. You took the cage off. Well, what do you do? You're an artist and you have this material. You don't throw it away. Yeah, it's copper. You can recycle it, get some money back, go, go down and buy fresh wire. But what I decided to do was, in my experimentations with this, see what the cage will do over time. What if I blew this, took the cage off, got the glass out, assembled the cage back together again, all right, and then blew it again a second time? What would happen? Well, here's an example of that right here. You just saw uh, Bella Vespa del Mare over there, and now you're looking at retread. Why is it called retread? Because the cage that was used to make that piece was recycled into this cage to make this piece. And it's really interesting to see how the copper gets annealed. It's hot, it's bend, it bends, it flexes, and it does all sorts of strange things. So this is a very funky kind of form that we got out of that cage. And what I also did with this one to add some variety was to just kind of put another piece up here going around the top kind of give that texture to kind of tie that in. So um, for me, the fun is in making the structure after the glass is made in this case or the other case, because I, on these pieces, I always make the glass first before I do the structure. And um, I'm thinking about changing that. And where I may try to go to the future with this is completely reverse this process. In other words, um, this will be metal, this will be glass instead. And try to try to kind of reverse it and see see how successful that might be. You are watching City Channel Four. On TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.